Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Yong Su No uh, from Hapmi Pharmacom, uh, um, responsible for the Onco Research and Development. And I see uh, 22. I was supposed to talk about that, but uh, I was hesitant because uh, for about 15 years I was involved in uh, clinical uh, trials. And I was also involved in pediatric uh, clinical trials. And it, I actually had about uh, three. Uh, I was involved in three uh, clinical trials. And uh, from uh, PMDA as well as from MFDS, we heard uh, f from uh, their experts about the uh, the uh, participate as the rapporteurs as the uh, of in the process of guideline development as well as the uh, expert working group, and they have uh, provided excellent uh, presentations. And, but my topic today is related to E11, and I think that it was difficult to invite experts uh, related to E11, and I think that's why I was asked to talk about E11. And here in Korea, we don't have much experience related to pediatric uh, clinical trials, although uh, I don't have much experience, but I do have three. I was involved in three uh, clinical trials for the pediatric patients, you know, directly, indirectly, and that is why I uh, was uh, given this opportunity to give the presentation. And when I first uh, started making the presentations, I regretted uh, taking up the offer uh, from the organizer. But I was uh, preparing for the presentation. I was able to learn quite a, a bit of uh, quite a lot. And I think that uh, by my presentation, I uh, hope to help you to prepare better uh, for the pediatric clinical trials. And this is what I'm going to be covering today. I'm going to give you the overview of the ICH E11 R1. And so I'm going to talk to you about uh, the overall uh, overview of this uh, revision. Uh, some of you may know about this, but uh, many of you uh, are not that familiar uh, with the uh, ICH E11 R1. So I'm going to give you that overview. And at Han Mi Farm, we have done some pediatric clinical trials and we have learned uh, some experiences and lessons. And I'm going to be sharing those lessons with you here today. And uh, real, uh, lately, I was uh, involved in um, patient preference uh, study. It's a study that's not that uh, done, uh, done widely here in Korea. And uh, as uh, Korea, Brazil, and China so uh, participated, so experts in those uh, part uh, countries uh, participated in this uh, uh, organization. And uh, E6, which is related to GCP, we just memorized them. And so when I first joined the company, we actually had the text uh, test about the E6. So we uh, had to understand the guidelines in order to be able to implement uh, clinical trials. But as I uh, became involved as an expert related to guidelines for the ICH, I now uh, have better understanding about the purpose of the guidelines and how uh, the guidelines are developed. And in those processes, I had interactions with the uh, regulatory organizations such as uh, MFDS, FDA, and PMDA. And I I understand how the concepts of the guidelines are made and how those uh, guidelines are actually uh, created. And, uh, so now I understand uh, the importance of ICH guideline. So ba uh, based on that uh, background, I was able to create this uh, presentation material on E11. And uh, E11 was actually uh, uh, adopted in 2000. And there are uh, guidelines go through, you know, from step one through uh, step five. Before the year 2000, the each uh, regulatory authority, when uh, had, uh, oh, uh, they 
of course, uh, sometimes expanded uh, the indications to include uh, pediatric patients, but there were not that many cases. And also, uh, the uh, the guidelines were quite different for the pediatric indications among the uh, regulatory authorities. So that is why we needed a guideline to uh, harmonize these different guidelines. And that is why ICH uh, decided to come up with uh, this uh, guideline, that is E11. And so the uh, regulatory authorities and the experts uh, came together to uh, develop this guideline, and uh, they were, the final version was adopted in 2017, and uh, and people uh, be, and and each uh, regulatory authority, but they may have their own uh, guidelines, but FDA, EMDA, PMDA, FDA, they also have their own uh, regulations. And sometimes there are conflicts between their, these regulatory organizations of uh, guidelines and the ICH guidelines. And with the development of science and technology, uh, we also needed to incorporate those uh, advancements in science. And so from, uh, I think that was back in 2000, and 15 uh, began to incorporate those uh, changes. And, and that is why there was a revision uh, back made uh, in 2017. And uh, 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 Ms. Do, after me, is going to be making a presentation about uh, E11A, which is about uh, pediatric extrapolation. And this is about modeling assimilation for the uh, pediatric clinical trials. So this is actually a sub-guideline that was uh, developed and was recently adopted, actually in August of 2024. And if you look at the contents of the table, uh, the table of contents, in the first, there's an introduction. And introduction uh, contains objectives of the guidance, background, and the scope of the guidance, and uh, general uh, principles. And the second part of EICT 11 contains guidances. And these are, and the first part of it is related to issues when initiating a pediatric medicinal product development program. And, and the second part is related to a pediatric formulations and one about the timing of the studies. And then about the types of studies of the PK or efficacy or the PMS. Those are the types of the studies. So those studies are described. And also a pediatric patients. I mean, they, uh, you may just think they are children, but uh, science science on so by a uh, science based or physiologically or biologically there are differences between pediatric patients and adult patients and so there are different age classification of the pediatric patients so, so that information is contained as part of uh, the guidance and then uh, it also uh, there is also uh, uh, information about ethical issues in pediatric uh, studies as for the objectives of this guidance, uh, before the year 2000, when it comes to new drug development, uh, the, for the uh, pediatric uh, there were, were of, uh, of course, clinical of uh, trials for the pediatric patients, but it was not that active. And because there were not that many uh, clinical trials uh, with the uh, uh, pediatric patients, what happened was that the information from the clinical trials with the adults were uh, used. And so there were less a uh, basis or the justification about uh, the uh, dosage and the formulation. So with this guidance, uh, it what uh, the attempt is made for to uh, have the outlines uh, for the safe, efficient, and ethical uh, study of the medicinal products uh, for uh, the pediatric patients, and that uh, uh, those of. Uh, uh, approaches and the critical issues are held uh, dealt with in this part of the in this guidance. And as for the background, uh, the development of medicinal products, the pediatric use has not been progressing easily, and uh, therefore there was lack of information for the uh, pediatric patients, such as dosage and the formulation, and so uh, I think that was uh, Dr. Sharkey. And uh, back in 1968, 
uh, he uh, came up with a terminology called a, th a therapeutic or orphans and came up uh, and he uh, came up with the uh, the need to have uh, clinical trials for the pediatric patients and let's look at the scope of ICH uh, 11 and there are some considerations when doing the pediatric drug development in terms of formulation the 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 tablet or the or the the formulation of drugs for the adults may not be appropriate for the patient so Oh, so pediatric patients, excuse me. So there is a need for appropriate uh, formulation and toxicity uh, uh, consideration of excipients uh, for pediatric patients. And so that is one of the considerations when developing uh, pediatric drugs. And also when doing uh, clinical uh, trials, uh, you cannot just begin clinical trials uh, for uh, pediatric patients. There have to be uh, appropriate uh, timing and types of studies to facilitate uh, pediatric drug development. And also, uh, pediatric patients are not one single uh, type of population. There are different uh, types of pediatric population, so there has to be classification per age. And there would also need to be, uh, be ethical uh, consideration. And also, uh, there uh, has to be a scope uh, defined for the, uh, the considerations that are uh, given to when uh, deciding to develop uh, pediatric drugs for the indications in ch children. And uh, uh, so we do need to consider if the, uh, the drugs are really needed, uh, for, and the particular drugs are partic uh, needed for pe uh, pediatric patients. And on the uh, uh, the development, of course, has to be uh, the development of product information in pediatric patients should be timely, and it, they also require development of pediatric uh, formulations, and that is you know important part of the general principles of ICH eleven. And when administering the drugs, uh, there are safety as well as the ethical issues, and so the the pediatric patients should be protected, and also they should be shielded from unexpected uh, risks, and. And these uh, concerns should be shared by uh, the industry, uh, regulatory authorities, and health professionals, as well as uh, the whole uh, the society as a whole. And uh, when there are issues related to the development of pediatric uh, medicinal product development, uh, there are things they need to be defined. They need to be clearly of, uh, 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 defined what they are. Sometimes it's quite difficult to do uh, clinical trials for the pediatric patient of you know ethically. So uh, the, the the prevalence of the condition to be treated in the pediatric uh, population has to be considered uh, uh, early on. And also the, the seriousness of the condition to be treated has to be considered as well. And if there is an alternative treatment for that particular condition, then, uh, you, uh, then there has to be consideration about the access to such drugs. And if this is a novel drug, and if there are uh, similar drugs within the same class, and if there are sim whether similar drugs have been approved, it has to be considered. And when doing a clinical uh, trials with healthy adults, and the clinical uh, trials uh, for uh, pediatric patients, uh, the endpoints have to be uh, different. And uh, there has to be an assessment whether those endpoints are appropriate for the, uh, the pediatric uh, population. And so uh, when we talk about pediatric population, if they are, pe uh, I mean, they're not sim not you know simply uh, patients who are not adults. So we do have to give uh, more detailed consideration as to who these uh, pediatric uh, population is. And the most important thing is safety. I mean, the drugs have to be safe. Uh, the trials have to be safe for adults, but it has to be even more safer uh, for uh, the pediatric patient. And so the uh, safety profile from the adult clinical trials have to be uh, considered before uh, this 
deciding uh, whether such a clinical trial should be conducted for the pediatric patients despite these uh, safety issues. And the, uh, the formulation uh, for that is appropriate uh, for the pediatric population has to be considered uh, from the get-go. And related to the pediatric uh, formulations, The, in order to uh, many different types of formulations are developed in order to enhance uh, compliance. I, uh, so when I was little, I had difficulty swallowing and, and the tablet. So I, and I remember taking powder type, but now I don't like powder types. But uh, for uh, little children or for the pediatrics in order to uh, increase the compliance, we do have to develop uh, formulations for them. In terms of taste, in terms of color, uh, we need to think about of the formulations that would be more acceptable to uh, children. And as when it comes to injectables, oh, if uh, the injectable, uh, the uh, the amount would be uh, with less than in the volume that would be given to adults, but, but there has to be uh, uh, some study as to how much need to be injected uh, for children. And for the uh, newborns, for the children, as for th and as for th the uh, for there is uh, benzene alcohol uh, toxicity. Uh, for a very uh, preterm uh, newborns is something that has to be given even more caution because uh, here as uh, some of the excipients may have uh, toxicity. And for the preterm uh, newborns, uh, there are uh, many uh, considerations that have to be given and that information is contained in this particular uh, gui uh, guidance. About the timing of studies, there are three uh, it can be looked at from three uh, different uh, areas, and I have, as I said, I've had about three. Uh, I have uh, three uh, experiences uh, in relation to the pediatric uh, clinical trials. And the first, f for the uh, the, there is a need uh, for the development of drugs for the pediatric indication. So that is when you would need to conduct a study. And if something, uh, if uh, it would be uh, it, uh, referred to, it would be related to uh, disease that are quite uh, fatal and quite uh, severe. And we are high in, so we have uh, a special uh, drug uh, for children who is lacking in glucagon. So they would have us uh, uh, the the uh, congenital uh, hyperinsulinism. And so if they do are not given a proper uh, glucagon, and then they would be uh, have a, a fatal experience. And so in Korea, in EU, and in the United States, we are conducting uh, this uh, clinical trial. And for the adults, uh, with the healthy adults, we have to get the safety information that is from the phase one. And based on that uh, result, using a PK uh, modeling, uh, we will have we have decided on uh, the form uh, the uh, dosage. Uh, for the pediatric patients, and so that way, uh, so that was uh, uh, the indication for which we could begin to do a uh, clinical trials uh, for uh, for uh, the pediatric patients, and as for the. Uh, the drugs that are more prevalent in children or the pediatric patients, the development would have to be done uh, early on. And so we were doing of a clinical trials for the adult for the solid uh, cancers, and uh, for particular solid cancers, we had the higher prevalence for a pediatric population. Uh, we utilized the adult data and extrapolated that data, and to, to include a clinical trials with the of uh, the patients above the age of uh, twelve. And so we used uh, we could do a pediatric clinical trials utilizing. Uh, the adult data in the initial stage. 
And uh, of course, uh, there will be higher risks when doing the pediatric clinical trials. And therefore, uh, it would be uh, wise, wise uh, to get as much information as possible from the adult clinical trials. Uh, ethically, that would be a more appropriate way. And so, and the, if it's not the first case or the second case that I've mentioned before, then you have to get the approval for the adults. And based on the data that have been acquired, uh, the indications can be uh, expanded. And if there is PK and PD data using a modeling a simulation, the indication could be extended. And utilizing a PMS, of, uh, you could uh, collect a data uh, about uh, the uh, pediatric patient and then update uh, the data. We have uh, a max buffin which is our product, and that was the case where we have extended the uh, indication by uh, collecting information during the pharmacovigilance uh, stage. And uh, there are four types of studies. The first one, uh, this is the, the simplest one, uh, which we'll be comparing a PK of the uh, adult clinical trials and the pediatric uh, clinical trials. And so uh, utilizing PK compared to the exposure, if the dose could be a, a decrease, uh, for instance, like this uh, for the pediatric patients and other PD markers or the safety markers uh, could uh, be, if they could be extrapolated, and then on the PK uh, study would be sufficient. But if it's not enough, then in phase two and phase three, there has to be efficacy related uh, studies to prove the efficacy uh, for the pediatric patients in order to get the uh, approval for the uh, pediatric patients. And in terms of short-term uh, safety, the uh, adverse events are from the adults, where they would be, uh, they could show, uh, show some relationship uh, per, that is, uh, dosage. But uh, the, uh, the pediatric patients, they grow. And so uh, they would have, uh, you know, of, of some changes. They would have some changes that occur as they uh, grow. And so uh, there would have to be uh, of, uh, different information utilized. And so we would have to collect information in the uh, PMS uh, phase to uh, continue to update uh, the information. And for the chronic disease, and if the, and also disease with uh, not much of a safety uh, issues, then we could get the approval uh, with, from the adult uh, clinical trials, and then we could continue to update the information from the PMS phase to uh, have a, a pediatric uh, indication. And as for the age classification of the pediatric patients, it's, it's different per country, but it's usually below the age of 18. And the, uh, the first phase would be uh, preterm uh, newborns. So they, and the, after the birth, that is 27 days within, uh, tw 27 days after the birth, they, so these are, uh, are their date of the birth is about, for instance, like a 27 days earlier than expected a date of delivery. And depending on these days, uh, there are of uh, the uh, the babies, so the newborns are quite heterogeneous, but it's quite difficult uh, to define all the preterm uh, newborn and infants. So in terms of weight, and in terms of uh, age, there needs to there is a need for the stratification, and also there uh, the overall uh, blood uh, volume is uh, uh, is low. So those things have to be considered, and and the data is also quite heterogeneous for these uh, 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 babies. Although I don't have much experience when. Uh, I don't think there are that many clinical trials for the preterm newborn infants. And if the drugs are to be developed for such, but there are need for the development of drugs for these sort of uh, infants. And it would be uh, necessary, uh, it would be quite useful to refer to the data uh, from uh, the uh, clinical trials from FDA and other uh, organizations uh, that have uh, received data about these preterm newborn infants. And as for the newborns, and these are the post-term newborns. But there are growth is not complete, of course. 
and so there are uh, variations and and their BBB is not uh, fully uh, mature and so there could be a, a CNS a risk for these newborn and infants so that's something that has to be considered and for the infants and toddlers who would fall uh, between the 28 days to 23 months and they have very rapid uh, CNS uh, maturation and their body growth is very rapid at this uh, period and uh, they have a uh, considerable uh, inter-individual uh, variability in terms of a maturation and the next step or next phase will be children and the children are defined as a population between the age of 2 and 11 they have uh, they can do drug clearance and they have uh, physical growth and they would have some onset of puberty and uh, they would have also neurocognitive cognitive uh, development as so they have a self-awareness and self-conscious that they don't really listen to you know what the adults say and so during the clinical trials uh, the compliance becomes an issue so compliance has to be uh, considered as uh, when doing uh, clinical trials uh, for this age group and the adolescents are the uh, the population between the age of 11 and 18 and they would have a characteristics very similar to adults and if so FDA's uh, adults uh, guide, uh, guidance uh, could be utilized in terms of PK and PD and so, and so if uh, it's shown that there's not much difference then adolescents could uh, take part in the uh, adult uh, clinical uh, trials. However, of course, uh, compl in terms of compliance, there has to be more consideration or more thoughts given to the adolescents than the adults. And there are some uh, ethical issues. And this uh, first issues are related to RRB uh, and IECs. Of course, you have to get the protocol approval uh, from the IRBs and IECs. But uh, for the pediatric of uh, clinical trials uh, on the IRB, there has to be an expert that has of uh, you know, expertise when it comes to uh, pediatric issues. When we were doing a clinical trial that uh, solid uh, cancer, the PI, uh, one of the PI was from the hematology department, but we had a uh, another PI uh, from the uh, pediatrics uh, department and so that uh, the uh, clinical uh, trials that include the pediatrics could be done in a more ethical way. So that is why we were able to get the approval from the uh, relevant IRBs. And in terms of recruitment, the uh, these populations well, we cannot get a consent uh, from uh, this population. So we need to get a consent uh, from their legal guardians uh, or parents. But you do have to provide information or explanation to the patient, these uh, pediatric patients, because they are the ones that are going to be participating in the study. But you, uh, uh, in addition, you do have to get an, uh, the consent from parents and the legal uh, guardians now, about the benefits and the risks uh, about participating in the clinical trials have to be explained uh, sufficiently. And and you also have to tell them that they can withdraw uh, the consent uh, whenever they want. Uh, and if you know, they want to withdraw from uh, the study, that they can. So that sort of information has to be uh, provided. And one of the PIs was a pediatrician. And the, uh, the, the, we would have uh, oncologists for the adults, and we would also have, you know, pediatricians uh, for the uh, pediatric patients. And so it's quite important that we have pediat uh, pediatricians because they would have more expert knowledge about the pediatric patients. And there are some unexpected risks that are, can occur during the course of the uh, clinical trials. And uh, it has to be of a 
made easy. It has to, uh, the the people should be or the participants should be able to withdraw from the uh, the clinical trials if they do face unexpected risks. And when doing a biopsy or a drawing in blood, while children are under great uh, distress, I mean children would be uh, under bigger duress than uh, adults. And so when there were so uh, there is uh, need for to minimize invasive uh, sampling or uh, invasive uh, procedure. And sign, however, uh, 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 so therefore there needs to be ways of to uh, collect these samples in a, uh, a scientific and medical way uh, without giving too much stress to uh, the children. And so these guidelines have been utilized in order to uh, develop uh, pediatric drugs. Um, of course, it cannot be perfect from the uh, the very beginning. And there are issues that arise and the conflicts also arise in the process of the implementation of the guidance. And so there was a need for the updates. And uh, through ICH guidance uh, revision, we made an update to this particular guideline back in 2017. And there are about eight, so this was includes a glossary, about eight, uh, content have been uh, included in the in the part of the introduction. There is a description about the objective of having this uh, of uh, revision, and the second thing is related to ethical consideration, and the third is about a commonality of scientific approach for pediatric drug development and programs. And even if you have ICH guidelines, each uh, regulatory authority would have of its own uh, guidelines. So those of guidelines need to be considered. And also there has to be a uh, age uh, classification. And then uh, there has to be uh, approaches needed to optimize pediatric drug development. PKPD modeling uh, simulation uh, results have to be described. And also tools have already also been uh, developed. And so those tools uh, were, and the techniques would have to be uh, utilized. And that information is included in, uh, in five. And so that uh, data is to be used uh, uh, well. And then from an industry's uh, point of view, uh, when doing a, a pediatric uh, clinical trials, we do face many challenges in terms of recruitment and so forth. And so there are differences between adult clinical trials and the pediatric uh, uh, clinical trials. And also there has, so uh, you do have to consider the feasibility first, you know, whether it's feasible to do a cl a pediatric clinical trials. And then there has to be also uh, a special attention that is paid to the long-term clinical as, uh, aspects and also, also the pediatric formulation has to be given special attention as well. And let's look at the scope and objectives. The uh, so the uh, study has to be done in a safe and ethical way according to the initial guidelines, uh, initial guidance. So, uh, of course, that is also the objective of this revision. But uh, there are some um, variability among um, the uh, regulatory authorities. So, but what's important, and therefore there is a need for harmonization. And so with through PKPD uh, studies, we would get a lot of data, and that data should be utilized to do minimal clinical trials, but at the same time try to get as much information as possible about the pediatric population. And that is uh, one of the objectives of the revision of the ICHE 11. And about the ethical uh, consideration, what's important is this one, child or children. Uh, may not be able to make uh, a judgment or the decisions in 
and so they do need uh, that so there's a need to get informed consent from the legal guardians and parents however it's important that information is sufficiently provided to children so we do need to get informed consent from the children as well as from uh, legal guardians vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, parents and uh, you there will be uh, preclinical and non-clinical studies are sometimes uh, conducted in parallel, and that uh, and the information from such studies should be utilized to update the clinical trials. And depending on the risks and, def and uh, depending on the situations, uh, the patients uh, should be allowed to withdraw. Uh, from the study. Uh, sometimes uh, the, uh, the patient uh, started participating in the clinical trials when he or she was 16. Uh, and we actually had a patient who uh, from the UK who was participating in 16, but with the long-term follow-up, he, uh, in, the, uh, in that long-term follow-up, he uh, uh, was, became older, like 20. And so we uh, uh, talked to uh, other uh, disciplines that is the experts from other uh, uh, disciplines and transferred this patient to another study that is a study with the adults. And uh, these are uh, some of the of uh, the ICFs that you could use in the uh, in the uh, pediatric clinical uh, studies. And so you do have to provide sufficient information to uh, the pediatric patients. Uh, as I said, you also have to get the consent from the parents as well. And you have to tell them about their rights to withdraw from the study. And also uh, there is sometimes needed updated uh, consent, informed consent. And that, as you can see, there are two types of uh, informed consent, one uh, for from the adolescents and the other from the parents. Scientific and for the scientific approach, there are commonalities in it. It's not just about this guideline alone, but even in other guidelines, actually, this commonality is also uh, found. Although there are ICH guidelines, the different regulatory bodies have their own uh, scientific and administrative differences. So for that, uh, we need to uh, think about how we can harmonize and apply this approach and sometimes we do the clinical studies in one country but many times we do it in multi-center in different countries and there are gaps or the differences between different regulatory bodies and their guidelines and therefore we need to think about how we can approach to that differences so from the early days for the uh, pediatric, pediatric indication or the drugs, if we uh, develop this kind of a drug, then we have to think about this strategy. So on uh, needs, if there isn't any medical upmen need, or what would be the appropriate pediatric population, and what about the safety issues? how those safety issues are applied uh, to the pediatric populations and for the pediatric uh, clinical trials what kind of uh, operational strategies need to be uh, developed these are the things that we have to think about but industry actually uh, makes the decision however it requires approval and the discussion with the regulatory body and therefore from the early phase in stage, it is important for pharma companies to communicate with uh, uh, far, uh, the regulatory bodies in the countries where they want to do the clinical trials. That's really critical. MFDS, FDS, EMA, and the PMDA, pre-IND, or they have the pre-submission consultation process. So we need to utilize that process very actively to our benefit so that we can have a very good strategy to the clinical study. So here, with the FDA and EMA, what we do, uh, the clinical trials in both region, uh, as you can see here, there are differences. The EMA, PIP, Pediatric Investigation Plan, there is a PIP for the EMA and for PDA, Initial Pediatric uh, Study Plan, IPSP. 
So the spirit itself actually uh, in line with the ICH guidelines. However, still there are the, some differences in terms of the processes or the time point between the different uh, regulatory bodies. So we need to check them from the very early stage and have some external consulting or the feedback on it so that we can uh, make the strategy, the right strategy for the overall process. For example, when we do the clinical study in the U.S., we were able to enroll the patients uh, from the age of two. But the safety data, the non-clinical data, the juvenile toxicity data, we provided that kind of in, uh, information and data, and we were able to uh, get the approval from the FDA to enroll the patients from uh, age of two. But EMA uh, said that we need to enroll the patients from the age of 12, and then we may be able to expand later on. So these kind of things need to be uh, studied and thought about very thoroughly from the beginning. For age classification, it's not just a simple classification. We need to think about uh, the benefit of the drug to the specific uh, subgroups and also they have to think about the concern in terms of the safety. So it's really important to decide the age classification or the subgroups for the pediatric population. And it's not easy to include very young population uh, from the uh, start of the clinical trial. It usually uh, a gradual approach from older age to younger age. So what we develop oncodrug, here you can see there are three phase one trials targeting at adults and then B love mutation patient, patients with a B love mutation. Uh, they have a lot of uh, adolescent population, so we uh, started to include adolescent who are over age of 12. The PKPD of the adult population were studied so that you know, we were able to decide the dosage for the adolescent. And then once we have the data from that population, the adolescent population, then we were able to expand the population to children uh, as young as two years old. And those optimization or the optimization is also important pre- and non-clinical toxicology and adult population clinical study. So the data from those studies need to be fully utilized in order to set the dose and the regimen for the pediatric population in the clinical study. So we have to build a rationale for that. So the data is really important. But at the same time, the extrapolation is really important. The extrapolating PKPD data from the adult population, uh, academically and technically, uh, there have been many uh, advancement and evolution in that approach. So even the rationale, they can even substitute clinical trials for the pediatric population is even uh, proposed. So PKPD modeling is really important for the pediatric population because sometimes the actual clinical study in the pediatric population may not always be uh, feasible or viable. So for the modeling, I think the next presenter will explain more. But when it comes to the modeling and simulation, I'm not an expert of it. However, I can say that it cannot be always 100% perfect. Non-clinical to clinical PDPK data, when we look at them, we need to have the accumulated data in order to have enhanced accuracy. And um, the expert need to be involved in review those data and uh, decide whether this modeling and simulation are right one or not. And also, so small, small size uh, pediatric population clinical trial can also be conducted in parallel. So usually the pediatric modeling 
and the simulation can utilize to set the dosage and also dose and also the DDI for the uh, pediatric population. Actually, for the DDI, uh, there is no need to do the DDI work for the pediatric population, and that's what is guide what the guideline says. So, for the pediatric uh, clinical trials, for two cases. We utilize the PK and PED modeling in order to set the initial dose for the pediatric population. So it's important to actively uh, utilize and use this type of a approach. And of course, it's not always uh, easy and actually it's challenging uh, to enroll adult population for the clinical trial. There are, it's really difficult. But when it comes to the pediatric population, it's more challenging. Although we do not have a lot of experience, but still, in pediatric population, the clinical trials, the number of the pediatric subject is very small, relatively small, and the, the perception of the patient group or the caregivers are still low. So it's really important to engage the potentials pediatric uh, participants. So when it comes to the feasibility, we have to think about many different factors, whether it is the, uh, the patient, the pediatric patient or the caregiver, we need to think about their needs and we need to listen to them carefully and then try to reflect them uh, into the scheme so that we are able to follow the protocol. And I will explain it later a little bit. But when it comes to the advocacy group, it's really important to work with the advocacy group well. Accelerate. This is Accelerate, an organization that provides the opportunity to the pediatric oncology patient, cancer patient. So we participate in the conference uh, held by Accelerate, present our drug, and also share scientific knowledge, not just on our drug, but also in general in the oncological approach to the pediatric population. So we were able to communicate and interact with the, uh, the regulators and the pediatric pediatric population, patient groups, and others. So there was a, a really good opportunity to present and communicate with the stakeholders. So especially for the global uh, big farmers, they are very active in this point. So uh, we were able to learn from them. And when we developed the drug for the CHI, or the con congenital hyperinsulinism, we were able to meet the advocacy groups and the uh, children patients. So we were able to understand their situation and the needs and also sympathize with them. So by helping them and by supporting them, we were able to also publicize the opportunity uh, to participate in the clinical trial. So for the young children, neonates, even in the neonates, when it is not well controlled, then the patients with the CHI can even die. So actually, as you can see from this picture, the survivors of the CHI also participated in this uh, gathering. So they were able to share their stories and also, we provide a support in information that these patients with the CHI can manage their disease better. And it's more uh, likely for them to participate in our clinical trials too. For the outcome, there are endpoints, and these endpoints may be different from the endpoints for the adults. So we have to think about them and how we can use them. And for the safety, the long-term safety outcome is really important, and especially like the uh, growth and the moderation. So in the long-term 
uh, follow of these things need to be considered in the protocol for the outcome. As I said, for the pediatric patients, there are exploratory safety objectives here. You can see in the protocol, it is clearly stated and growth and moderation, the best and the, the changes compared to the baseline is measured neurological outcome and the bone growth. They are also followed up in the long term basis and these are stated in the protocol. So the long term follow up, as you can see here in the study uh, flow chart, for the pediatric population, as you can see here, every three cycle, as you can see, there are three different cycles. And every uh, three cycle, there is a long term uh, follow up for the maturation and others. And until three years, because the brains develop, the head circumference is also measured as a part of the safety monitoring. So for formulation, for the formulation, the tablets or the capsules that are easily taken by adults population, other than that the mini tablets or this dissolution films or curing tablet, chewing tablets, the formulations that are easy to be taken by pediatric population needs to be also developed and thought about. And even for the excipients, of course, um, the exp safe excipients and also the culturally acceptable excipients in many different cultures in terms of the taste and color. So these are considered and the masking can be one way. And of course, the palati uh, palatability and acceptability. We do the taste test testing and taste the masking. Especially for neonates, actually it's really difficult and challenging uh, to make the administration to neonate. So intramuscular injection uh, can be a stress to neonates. So we try to avoid it and cross monitoring is critical here. So I want to share one case through this kind of a development process, we are able to develop good drugs. But here I want to share a approved drug from the FDA, which is the Tovrafenib. This is a day one's uh, product, which is the biotech company in the US. And this is for the uh, low grade glioma. And body surface area is the basis for the dosage determination. And there are tablets and oral suspension. And this is for the six months of age and older patients. So the formulation is the oral suspension. So it is developed as an oral suspension in consideration of the pediatric population. And in the black label, there is a warning label. It has a growth effect. So the long-term follow-up, the reductions in growth velocity have been reported, routinely monitor growth in pediatric patients. Of course, the long-term uh, PNS data and PMS data, other data can be added. And then this kind of a, a, a labels uh, can be updated. And in terms of the regulatory exclusivity, actually pediatric drug has the benefit. If you visit the FDA website, you can see the pediatric exclusivity granted, the review papers and the labels, you can check them so that you can uh, think about uh, your strategy in developing the new drugs for the pediatric population. And actually, there is a very good workshop for this part uh, held in uh, October this year. The guidelines, development strategies, and operation of the clinical trials 
And of course, other than that, other than this, there will be uh, other good opportunities for learning. So building network and learning through this kind of an opportunities will help you uh, to proceed with the clinical development. So as a conclusion, uh, doing the clinical trials for the pediatric population is very challenging. However, uh, the right dosage and the right drug for the population, the children, is really important. So we can utilize the data, existing data, and also utilizing them to the fullest benefit is critical. In terms of that, the PKPD modeling data is really important so that we can decide how uh, and what and how much we can administer uh, the drug into pediatric population. Recently, as I said before, I was involved in the ICHE 22 patient preferences studies uh, working group. So it's not yet that much well known, but from the marketing perspective, like the patient preference, of course, has been studied in Korea sometimes. But FDA or EMA, actually the risk benefit assessment is also include and reflect the patient preference. So patient reported outcomes, of course, you know it. So the guideline work, development work is going on on this point, but it, this is not well known to the Korea. So I believe that the MFDS and also the pharma industry here, I kindly ask you to pay attention and also provide your feedback so that I can uh, convey the Korean opinion and Korean feedback to the working group, ICH uh, expert working group. So thank you.